this show brought to you by WP Relax. No matter whether you have an existing site, want to transfer your site, or need to start a WordPress site from scratch, we have a plan to suit your needs. So say bye-bye to WordPress problems and relax with WP Relax. Hi everyone, this is Ahmed Kremli and welcome to Be Efficient TV. The mission of this web TV show is to boost the efficiency of your business and life through tips and tricks from leading experts. And today I have with me Nathan Elote. He is the founder of InFocus Media. He is an expert in digital marketing, SEO, and hosting. Uh, Nathan has worked in, in many companies, many especially hosting companies like HostGator, uh, Bluehost, and uh, SEO Hosting. Welcome to the show, Nathan. How are you doing? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me as well. I definitely my, appreciate it. My pleasure. So what's your background and how did you start in the internet world? Yeah, well, my background is really uh, mathematics and engineering. Uh, that is my undergrad degree. I did electrical engineering. So I was always around technology and learning new things. And I just like the creative aspect of engineering, taking an idea of something you're thinking about and making it a reality. Uh, I took an internship with uh, Vanderbilt University, and when I took that internship, I did research for them for engineering. They asked me to do many things that had to do with business and related to internet uh, marketing for the research I was doing, and I thought to myself, I really need to learn a little more about specifically the internet marketing and business, so I pursued an MBA. Uh, at the secondary level and that's when I dove headfirst into uh, marketing the internet and as long as learning new tools as well so I've always been around technology but I started seeing certain trends pop up over and over where those skills would be needed there was like any connection between the MBA and the internet or just with the marketing and uh, management uh, to be a hundred percent honest when I was uh, pursuing my MBA, I really wanted to do IT management. I was around technology all the time, and I thought, well, let me further my you know, degree in technology. But whenever I took the marketing classes, I would always get perfect scores without even putting in much effort. So I had a couple professors say, hey, maybe you should look at this. And I said, well, okay. So it kind of came naturally for me, just certain ideas I was having. Plus, I already liked technology, and I was interested in code on my own. So just coupling that together with marketing just made that decision to uh, go ahead and pursue that with uh, marketing. So that's what I would say. It just came natural, and people just saw it in me. So I thought I would pursue that. Through the research, I saw like like I noticed that you read lots of books and uh, <laughs> like this question is it was not on the list of the questions and I okay. always ask the people who've done the MBA like if you come back now, you will do it again and what the MBA have added to your life to your entrepreneurship uh, like mm -hmm. to, to the entrepreneurial life I mean, not to the employment part of of your life. And now as an entrepreneur, would, like if you will go back, you'll still do it or no? I would still do it. Uh, and the main reason I would still do it is due to the fact that I was heavy background in technology. I didn't really even have time to uh, take any business classes or anything of that nature. I was just technology all the way. But understanding certain things from a business level lets you get a wider view of what you're doing so now it becomes I'm not just working on this piece of software that needs to be efficient you see the reasons and the audience of who may appreciate the software and who would work so it helps you think in a different mindset so if I had to do it over uh, I would do it over I will admit though uh, some of the things that I did learn the information is out there and available most people just don't know it so uh, it is available, it's not structured, but if you were to find it different places on the internet and different places in books, same information is available. But I would do it just because it helped challenge me, somebody who was heavy on technology and uh, not so much in business. So it made me a bit better business person and a better entrepreneur. Why you left the, entrepreneur, uh, like the employment life and, and uh, how did you do the transition to be a freelancer or entrepreneur? Uh, to be honest, I still dip in and out uh, every now and then. Uh, like, for example, uh, right now I'm working with a major retailer here in the uh, Houston, Texas area. And uh, I'm working with them mainly because it was a good brand. It was a good opportunity. 
Uh, they've been in business well over 30 years, and I'm doing web analytics for them. So I'm uh, observing different trends they have and making recommendations. So sometimes I work in-house with them and their team. But the main thing I would say is... So, so much, for, for, sorry to cut you off here. Like you work oh, with fine. them offline, uh, like uh, full-time, sorry? Uh, somewhat, somewhat, because they have a team. They're building up their team uh, relatively new to their company. So they've been in business and they've been successful, but they haven't had an uh, internet team. So I've been working with them to build that up, and it's getting to a decent size now. So uh, we'll see where that goes. But uh, I definitely do enjoy uh, freelancing and the whole entrepreneur track. The main reason is because when you're working uh, a certain employment job or working for an employer, you get the same task over and over again, and you don't necessarily have creative control of how the whole project is going to go. You have one section of the project, you complete that one section, and then it moves on to the next person. But um, as a freelancer and as an entrepreneur, you have control over who you're working with, uh, the type of projects you're taking on, but also you have a wide variety of projects and tasks. You may work with someone who is in the oil field industry, and next off, you may work with someone who is in software. So it really just depends upon the type of uh, client work you're doing, but you get more of a variety and more control. So uh, that's worth it. So you I got the job and you got like, what is your other focus? Like you do web development, SEO, analytics, uh, what else do you do? Uh, you pretty much named it, uh, web design, uh, web analytics. I do some graphic design as well. Uh, that mainly came about because Photoshop, some years ago, I just learned how to use it. And then I said, hey, you can use Photoshop to create the, you create web designs. Okay, so naturally went from, oh, I created a web design in Photoshop. Now I need to do the code behind it. So that was a natural trend, and I learned many things along the way. So that mainly has to deal with, as you mentioned, SEO, web design, graphic design. I do some print design as well, but also specifically dealing with branding. So branding certain products for companies and then mapping everything out. This is what the brand is. This is the look. This is the website. And the website goes and feeds into uh, certain SEO practices that we need to do. So I try to take them from beginning to start or redesign something that's not doing as well as they would like. You do everything yourself or you have a team with you or you just outsource? A little bit of both. I have a uh, team, a couple of associates that I tend to work with all the time. Uh, they also have their own freelancing businesses as well, but we come together on the projects I work on. So I have my go-to people um, as far as working on projects. I do also try to reach out and recruit uh, different people maybe that I haven't worked with. It just depends upon the work that I've seen them do in the past. So if we already have a prior relationship online, you know, with uh, networking, so... What what do you what do you like the most uh, between let's say if you if we divide it as web de web design web development and SEO? Hmm. I would say I like more so the design because uh, throughout the years, this is something that's not necessarily trained. It's just something that happens over time. Throughout the years. I've begun to get an eye for certain things, uh, observing something and saying, I think it would look best if you did this based on the color theory or based upon what I know behind the mathematics and the testing of certain A-B tests. I think you should say this in your copy. I think you should you know, work on this. The design should be these colors. It should be laid out this way just because of the habits of people on the web. So I would say web design is my favorite, I would say. Do you like to design the webs? Like, what's your strategy or how you work when you design websites? So you design them from scratch, or you you like to use, let's say, themes and then you modify them because they give you more, let's say, options or integration maybe with mobile, which makes your job easier later. Mm -hmm. uh, there's different trade-offs. Uh, if you, if I do it from scratch, I know the code. It's there. I know the code base. I can make it into whatever I want it to be. As you mentioned, mobile. I can do that as well. So there's an advantage of doing it from scratch. Uh, as far as a good time saver, like you mentioned, taking a template or a theme, that does cut a lot of time because there's already a framework there and I just need to turn it into certain elements of how I would like it to be. So there's different advantages. What is my favorite? Uh, 
I probably would say my favorite may be working with something that already exists and making it better. So that can be a redesign or perhaps even a template. That's what I would say. You worked with Invato. They are a big company and uh, doing well on the internet. Uh, how it works and what is Invato? Invato, uh, as you mentioned, they're a large company, been in business for some time. Uh, they're an Australian-based company. Uh, they do two things now. Uh, at first, it was just tools, uh, providing tools to different web developers, uh, photographers, graphic artists, uh, just different digital creatives. They offer tools that would help you make you better. So if you're working on code, maybe you, have a, you need a form submission page, they would have the code that's specifically for form submissions, and you can buy it from them and move on. So they were really targeted at developers and designers on the web. They've branched out and they also have a tutorial and teaching side. So you can also go to different Envato websites and learn certain skills, whether it's web design, uh, photography, even game development. So Envato has grown, but they, they either provide you with tools to be successful for your business or you can learn from them in different tutorials. The, the, the learning, uh, like say, division, is it like membership or is it for free or how it works? And uh, the design and code section, like mm -hmm. uh, let's say outsource people or developers, they can post their codes or the things that they can sell it there or how it works? And then they get a commission from each cell? You, you pretty much alluded to it uh, in Vado. On one end, they have different marketplaces. So if you have written something, whether it's a theme or a website template, or you've taken photos that you want other people to use on their websites as a stock photo, uh, you can upload it to their marketplace, uh, set a certain price, and as you mentioned, uh, when you, they take a percentage and you can take home a percentage as well as far as the marketplace so goes. So the percentage, uh, it does vary based upon your performance. I do remember in the past it was a little lower. Uh, it was about 40% that's increased to 50. And if you're more successful, uh, it just gets better as time goes along. So the more successful you are, the higher percentage you can bring in. It just depends upon how often you use their product. The, so they, they have, have changed that. They have 3D graphics. They have a music and video like video hive i think they have true, as well true. Um, they are very like they cover everything and they have great stuff in which division uh, you worked with them or department what was your focus with them my focus with Envato was working on their tutorial and teaching side so they as you mentioned you asked about membership they have uh, membership options it's changed quite a bit uh, but the, the whole base operation was they had a pretty popular blogs in certain subjects. So if you wanted to learn Photoshop, they had a blog just for Photoshop and design. If you wanted to learn Adobe Illustrator, they had a blog just based on Illustrator, blog based on photography, and they would have free tutorials online. But if you wanted more detail or you wanted to see the source code or you wanted to see you know, the source documents of the Photoshop document you're working in, that required membership. So they had a freemium setup. You can see a certain level of content for free on their blog, but if you wanted to go deeper, you had to be a member. And I worked on the tutorial and teaching side of things with a lot of their redesign. So a lot of the redesign I worked with them on and the setup of how tutorials are laid out in the flow of the certain materials that go along with those tutorials. So that was the work I did with Envato. From uh, from the U.S. or you've been based in, in Australia as well? No, here in the uh, U.S. I'm in the U.S. at the moment. So I work remotely with them. They're based in Australia, but they have many remote people that work with them as well. I think they do a great job just keeping up with everyone, even though they're in different time zones. Uh, everybody still provides excellent support in does great work just to make the site run but remotely you've been doing let's say tutorials and these things you don't mm -hmm. go to an office to do to shoot or do these things or they have certain system just to control you from home how it works they they set up certain criteria for you and they say you know this is the level of quality we would like uh, some people already have their own studio so they shoot different tutorials that way some people screencast uh, there are some tutorials that are written out, so people just write them out and screen capture the different steps on their screen. Uh, as far as some of the things that I've done, uh, I do have all the equipment to shoot, so I can shoot myself. Uh, I even have a studio in my house I've built, so I can use that. So either way, uh, sometimes I do go to the studio or just use a certain setup. It depends on what the tutor tutorial is about. 
and they put you on salary or your your commission based on like how many uh, episodes or like uh, tutorials that you do for them so what you mentioned you're pretty much uh, paid or commissioned based upon the level of uh, production you're producing or you did a course and you know your course has this many lessons in it and they pay you that way uh, some of the development I did was behind the scenes of the site so mine was based upon hourly uh, how, that's how that was set up so, so hey Nathan uh, and we need st you to still do now if somebody wants to like work with you to, to do mm -hmm. the, some tutorials you, you still can do it right correct correct okay I want to ask you what is HTML and CSS and what is the best free place online to learn them well HTML and CSS I would say if you're learning web design or interested in it or your job has anything to do with a website it would be beneficial to learn uh, HTML and CSS are the two basic uh, code bases to run a website so every website you see on the web if you go there you right click and do view source you're looking at HTML uh, and it's connected to CSS HTML is the framework of the site uh, how it looks how is the text appearing on the page how do images show up what are the sizes of the images CSS is the style of how everything is laid out certain fonts that you're declaring the size of those fonts what happens when you roll over an object so that's the difference between the two the best places I would say uh, I have many in mind now that I've, I've already learned I found out more uh, a couple I would name is uh, Envato uh, through their site called Touch Plus they have a great class uh, one thing that's for free they have is called learn HTML CSS in 30 days uh, another place that is good is called Code Academy. Uh, that's a great place to learn as well if you're, you know, new to trying to learn HTML and CSS. Those are a few places, and there's many other places on the net, but those specifically is uh, what I would say. And if you just want to look at the syntax itself, sites like HTML, Dog, or DevDocs, those are good places just to learn the syntax and what everything means. So those are a few places. So let's say if we are using a CMS of WordPress, which is a control management system, inside WordPress the code is what? Uh, WordPress is made out of a couple of things. Uh, the, the main things that make them run is you have JavaScript, you have HTML, you have CSS, and you also have an object-oriented code, PHP. So PHP queries the database. Uh, so you would also need a database if you're running WordPress as well. But those are the main frameworks that go into WordPress. There's a few other things that you can add on for functionality, but the main things, HTML, CSS, PHP, JavaScript, those are the main things you're going to see when running WordPress. So when I want to build my website, I mean, and if I'm an average user and I don't know what is like the framework to use, like which one I should use? I would recommend WordPress just because at least in working with certain clients it seems like that is the best solution for them that is the most easy to learn uh, also WordPress has grown very fairly popular uh, I know over you know six million over 60 million sites are using WordPress and it has a large community you can also learn from as well so uh, I, I tend to go to WordPress though uh, I use some other things but WordPress is the main thing I would recommend to people all right so which framework to, to use for my website if I'm building a website how to choose this framework or like let's say CMS to, to, mm -hmm. to build the web to build the site if you were building the site and you were thinking about a framework the main questions I would have is what exactly would you like to do uh, would you like to blog would you like to just have a basic website that you don't plan on changing do you need a landing page or perhaps are you selling something online so do you need e-commerce so based upon your needs I would recommend a certain framework of where to start I think there's certain frameworks that can be modified to do all the things I just mentioned but there's certain things that make it easier so if you're blogging I would say you probably should go with WordPress WordPress started as a blogging platform and it is uh, very good for that it already is set up for that but also if you wanted a website WordPress can do that as well just because the way it serves pages and certain content. If you're doing e-commerce, more than likely I'd recommend you go with Magento, uh, but that would also depend upon how many products you're offering. So it really depends upon your vision for your website, where you see it going in the future, and that would 
you know, be what I would use to recommend certain frameworks and tools to start with. So for, um, you said for e-commerce, gentle. How about membership sites? And uh, don't you think that, uh, like example, for myself, I'm comfortable with WordPress. I understand how it works, how to update the things. I, I don't know HTML, but like I can change the things somehow, the pictures and, exactly. and, the, and, and blog and do different stuff with it. Uh, so I feel more comfortable with it. Whatever website I develop, I try to go with it, even if it's an e-commerce or membership. And even like our show website is built on WordPress, however, it's a membership site. Uh, so what do you think about that? Do you think that, I think like everything somehow with the time is achievable by WordPress, mm -hmm. but why should I change to another one? What is the disadvantages, advantages for each framework? So I love WordPress. Uh, I use it all the time. Uh, I tend to try to recommend to stay within WordPress. You mentioned membership sites. I feel WordPress is great for that just because the way it's set up, it already has user roles. So you already have administrators, uh, basic users, subscribers, editors. It already has that functionality. So if you wanted to expand WordPress to build a membership site, I think it's great uh, for that because it already has the levels built into it. Why not? Uh, E-commerce, WordPress is also good for that. There's certain functionality you can add on to WordPress to sell something if you would like on the web. Many different plugins accomplish that. Uh, so WordPress is good for that as well. The only thing I see that may cause me to recommend something else when it comes to e-commerce is the number of SKUs or the number of products that you have. So I mentioned a retailer I'm working with. They have uh, thousands of SKUs and they're adding more. So because it's so many SKUs, the way that Magenta works and serves up content, it's a little more straightforward for them because they have such a large number of SKUs. So in certain instances, I would recommend, for example, as I said, Magento for e-commerce just because it's already built specifically for e-commerce and if you have a large amount of certain things, it works well. But I also have found WordPress works well. It just depends on the number of products you're trying to sell. Oh, it's gentle. I thought it's gentle. So if it's like for WordPress, if, I, if I'm selling, let's say, less than 100 or 1,000 products, it's fine to stay with WordPress. But if I'm selling more than that, I should go with Gento. Cor correct. Um, you should go with Magento if it's a high number, in my opinion. Uh, if you don't have that many products, then you can use WordPress. I've used WordPress for many things, conference registrations, uh, selling t-shirts online. I've worked with different people helping with that. So uh, that's what I would say. You, you're, you're on the right track, in my opinion, e either one of those you know, options. But again, uh, the best thing is work with things that you're familiar with. If, you're, if you don't want to learn Magento, because you have many SKUs and it's too difficult, make WordPress work for you, or perhaps find another solution that would be best. I think Shopify is pretty good. That's a hosted solution though. But Shopify is pretty good as well. So work with things that are easier for you. Uh, and if it's, it's easy for you to manage as the business owner, as the entrepreneur, as the person working on the site day to day, that's where you want to stay. Shopify is hosted and they charge you. It's like it's a membership and they have all the solution. Mm -hmm. It's great for people to start with, right? Definitely, I think so. And I always recommend people start small. Uh, whenever I'm working with clients, start small and as you see certain things, then upgrade and move along. You don't need some huge system to start out with. Sometimes that's best if you have a huge product offering and many different products, but I will say start small, see what happens, test it out, and then you'll have your answers on what the next move is. You Have you tested or used uh, Shopify before? And like, is it good for people, for let's say sites with high traffic, they can cope with that or there is problems or because they are a big company. How do you see it? I see, they've gotten better. Um, I've looked at them for some time. The current, uh, the current version they have right now is pretty good. Uh, they do pretty good maintenance on their servers. They keep up things. Uh, they make sure updates are smooth. They notify users of any changes. I have worked with it. I think it's good. I normally recommend people to go with Shopify if they don't want their own hosted solution or they're not yet ready for that. Also, you can make templates for Shopify and upload them. So you can tailor the look to be how you would like it to be. But once again, you have to learn their system, right? So uh, if you're not ready for a hosted solution, Shopify is good. But if you did have a hosted solution, you could really 
turn the site to however you'd like it to be? So most sites, like 20% of the sites are uh, using, let's say, uh, WordPress. What are the other 80%? Can you divide the other, let's say, platforms or CMSs used? And for why, for each one and why? Mm -hmm. There's quite a few other ones. Uh, WordPress, I love, as I mentioned. Uh, there's a few other ones out there. Drupal. Uh, Drupal is very similar to WordPress, but the way it, the core offering of how it works is different. Uh, Joomla is another solution. I've seen Joomla get a lot better throughout the years. I remember when I first started looking at everything, I thought WordPress was just easier, and Drupal was second. But And then Joomla, the way it was set up, was somewhat difficult. But... Joomla has improved a lot. Just is just the way they have things set up in the back end. So Joomla is another one besides WordPress, and I said Drupal. Uh, ModX was popular in the past, but it's not as popular as what it used to be. In my, from what I've seen, uh, Moodle, which is normally used for online learning, uh, that is another solution. I've seen certain people go with certain versions of uh, ASP when they want to work on a Windows server. Uh, they use that. But I've also seen people use WordPress on Windows servers because they just like how it works. There's a few other ones. Uh, there's a new platform called Ghost that people are using for blogging. Uh, that is fairly simple. It's, it's, very, it's minimal and it just makes sense. So those are the few other ones I've seen around online. More enterprise uh, clients tend to use certain things like SharePoint and they use their content management uh, with SharePoint. I don't think it's very straightforward at all when working with SharePoint. How, so how easy to shift between those? Like, let's say if I started somewhere and then later on I decided to move to WordPress, mm -hmm. how easy is to, uh, that to be done? And do you recommend any services for that or companies or like your company maybe can do it? Uh, we've done that before, move people from different platforms to WordPress. The main thing that will determine the level of difficulty is uh, can you export all of your data? And if you can, is it in a certain format that is easy to be ported over to WordPress? So if you have your database, can we map it to the new WordPress database the right way? Uh, or can it, at the very least, can it export all of your pages and content so that we can work with it and upload it? And if it's not, uh, difficulty would be manually, you know, <laughs> many nights of you know, copy, paste it, downloading and re-uploading just to reformat it. So it really just depends. So whatever you go with, uh, just in case certain needs change, always try to see in the beginning, uh, do I own my content and can I take it with me if I need to? Because it may come a day where, yes, you do need to take it with you. So you always want to make sure you own your own content and you can move it where you need to go. So if, it, if they make it easy, then pointing over to something like WordPress is easy. If it's not straightforward, like I've seen with some online website builders, it's a manual process. So we decided about the platform and CMS. Now, where to find, let's say, the best uh, themes and pictures, resources online? Okay, let's say pictures. Uh, I know a couple paid services, but the free is the best price, right? So uh, one place I like going to get free images is Unsplash. Uh, uh, unsplash is unsplash unsplash correct so like like a splash in the water it's unsplash so that's a good place to go uh, that is curated by the people that made crew there's a website called pit crew where they curate web designers and artists and graphic artists and they connect them with companies to do projects so they curate that those are some excellent images they're all hd uh, from landscapes to people to technology so Unsplash is a great place to go. Uh, Pick Jumbo is a number is another one. P I C Jumbo. Uh, Pickjumbo.com is another place to go to. Uh, those images are free. They're HD. Uh, that's another great place to go as well. So, another one if you're looking for technology or you're just starting up, there's one called uh, I believe it's StartupPictures.com or okay. PicturesForStartups.com. Uh, search either one of those online, but that's a great one because if you are a startup, and I think we're in the age of uh, internet startups, once again, there's a resurgence. So great photos for startups. They show a lot of interaction and technology and people working with each other. So those are some places to get uh, photos and images. As hope, I mentioned, uh, I hope I all the paid ones. 
The paid one, uh, one place I like is, and this is with Envato, uh, it's called Photo Dune, or you can go to uh, Envato and you can see them lay out their websites. But Photo Dune is a great one. That one, the way they have it laid out, based upon the level of quality you need, so high res, low res, uh, HD, based upon the quality you need, of course, like some other sites, that determines the pricing. But Photo Dune is a good place, and also uh, a sister site of Photo Dune is Theme Forest. Uh, they have many different themes that are in templates that are available there as well. So those are a few of the paid things that you can use to get a good start on what you're looking to do. Other sources for themes? Another one I like is Mojo Themes. Mojo, Mojo, theme, Mojo Themes. So M-O-J-O. -O. Uh, Mojo Themes, they have a little green uh, monster <laughs> mascot. So that's where you know you're on the right website. But Mojo Themes is great. Uh, they have a large theme offering and plugins. Uh, definitely for WordPress, uh, mainly is there the main one that they're pushing forward there. And there's a few others, I believe. Uh, what it Themes Kingdom, Themes Kingdom. Okay. Uh, they've gotten a lot better. I remember them when they first started. They've grown, and what they they've redone many of their uh, templates and themes. So they're pretty good as well. So those are a few I would say. What is the best plugins to speed up uh, WordPress website? Well, when you're talking about speeding up a WordPress, uh, one thing that I tend to use many times is uh, the Google PageSpeed application online just to see what is slowing down the website because uh, it may not be WordPress itself. It could be the images you're using. Maybe they're not optimized for the web. You could reduce the size of them. So I tend to look a little under the hood and say, what are the areas that have a problem? Uh, but one plugin I particularly like using is W3 Total Cache. Uh, I think that's a great plugin, and when I say W3 Total Cache, it's saving certain elements on your website so that it doesn't have to try to quarry uh, the database and your system over again to reload everything when someone comes to the website. So it saves certain elements. So W3 Total Cache is a great one uh, that I tend to use. Uh, also Cloudflare. Cloudflare works as a security layer, but it also works as a CDN, Content Delivery Network. And that works in a similar fashion. They save a certain elements on your site, and they have servers dispersed around the world. And when a visitor comes to the website, they load the version or the elements from your website that is closest to them so that it's faster. So uh, Cloudflare in conjunction with W3 Total Cache, I tend to use that quite often to help people speed up their sites. What's the perfect size for the pictures to be used on a blog or website? And if I have a problems with the pictures, I have to go manually and change them all, or there is a plugin for that? There are a couple plugins for that. Uh, for example, there's like a, a GZip plugin that uh, make if your server has GZip enabled, which is a compressing uh, mechanism on the server. If your server has that enabled, uh, you can use certain plugins that will allow WordPress to do that. So it, so, it will, so it will keep the picture the same size on the site, but it will reduce the, the I mean, the, the size in terms of correct, uh, megabyte. Correct. Or, yeah. True, true, true. That's, there's certain plugins based upon that that can be used for compression. I know one thing I tend to use is a couple of different things, but the main thing that I tend to do is when I see an image or cert certain things of that nature, there's websites... And there's plugins that come along with Photoshop that help with that. But there's websites like tinypng.org, tinypng.org. So if it's a PNG file, you can go there or you can go to jpegmini.com. You can use that. And basically what that is is if you have an image that's of certain size, you upload it to their systems. It compresses the image for you. And an important factor, it keeps it the same looking quality online so it compresses it but it keeps the image looking the same so you don't lose quality there and once you compress those then you upload that version to, yeah but this uh, your, process your takes time like any of these plugins when you let's say if i started my website for one year and and i have mm -hmm. lots of pictures there if i True. if i if i update this uh, plugin or download it install it on the site it will apply the effect of compression on all the old uh, pictures or no not certain why it would be going forward, uh, but as I mentioned, the ones that are using GZip plugins, 
uh, those would add some compressions to the image the images that are already there uh, besides that uh, certain things like Cloudflare and Mac CDN that have plugins for WordPress those work well also just because you don't really have to change much on your site itself and it handles image loading a lot faster and what is the perfect size uh, for the images that I should use on the site it varies for what you're using. I try to keep them around 100 kilobytes. Some images, based upon what it is, would be larger. But I try to keep it to 150 kilobytes or lower. I try to keep it somewhere along those lines. When you start getting into the 1 megabyte, uh, 2 megabyte range, or even you know half a megabyte, it's kind of bulky for an image. But it's understandable based upon what it is. But if it's that large, that's where CDNs and certain image optimization comes into play because it starts taking up a lot of your bandwidth and some, some hosting plans have unlimited bandwidth. In those cases, you may be fine, but those that have a certain allotment of bandwidth, then you would just be eating up your bandwidth really when you don't have to. Let's go deeper into search engine okay. optimization SEO. Uh, what's your advice on page for SEO on page? The I take a different approach because one thing people tend to forget and and we easily get caught up in optimization of oh, let me make sure everything is laid out Google can read it I, let me make sure the file is correct but we often forget sometimes a human is also going to read this right so when it comes to on-page SEO uh, I'm a big proponent for organization of content on your page so when you have organization of content on your page, you should have a main title and a main header, and you should organize your thoughts into different sections or sub thoughts or sub sections. So if you're doing that, make sure your H1 tag is the main uh, title of the content you would like to deal with. When I say H1, I mean the header tag uh, for a blog post or any content on the page. So make sure that's the main topic. Uh, under that, you'll have your. Uh, but text uh, sorry, session. sorry, sorry. Here mm -hmm. to cut you off. Like the H1 is uh, is the title, let's say, of a WordPress site. Mm -hmm. Is it by default H1, or you mean the one that you use it in the body of the of the blog post? I mean the uh, first even one. In the, even, the in, even in the body of the uh, blog post, because most of the time when you create a post and you have a title, uh, that's a good question you brought up because certain themes take the title of your post and they automatically make that the H1. Certain other types of themes or, or architectures that are set up, they take the title of your post and they make it the title of the article. So when Google is searching, it's the title of it, but they don't make it the H1. So that's an important thing to look over. Otherwise, you may have two H1 tags or something of that nature. So look at how your uh, WordPress is set up or look at how your page is set up if you're using a different architecture. You want to make sure that the H1 shows up. Uh, you can use it multiple times, but I would definitely recommend it using it once. And if you use it once, let that be the main title or the main subject of what you're referring to in the whole article uh, as best as possible. Then under that, you can use uh, H2 tags for certain sub-content or sub-thoughts of your, of your article, of your page, and then so forth with the H3s and the H4s as needed. Uh, and if you have a quote, uh, as as properly used, use block quote. So I tend to recommend using certain elements for what they're purpose for. If you have paragraph text, make sure it's wrapped in a paragraph tag. If you have an image, uh, give that image a title, but also give it an alt tag so that Google can search that particular uh, image. And if you have an alt tag, make sure you write content in the alt tag that describes what the image is, right? So uh, Google should, can should, find should, that. It's, um, is, is it better to add a name, to name the, the picture before uploading it? I would say both. I know when I work with clients and uh, some of the things that I work on, I recommend and I use the image is going to have either, either the title of the blog post if the image relates directly to it or the image is going to have some relation to what the actual image is and the blog post it's tied to. I'm working on a blog post. I'm using an image from uh, The Matrix, the movie series The Matrix about Neo. 
and because uh, sometimes people try to think to do everything so I say we're not the one but in that image I say this is Matrix Neo but then I also say uh, some lines of what it's relating to right so it's not just a random picture of the Matrix this picture is used in a blog article and I write a little more to describe that as well so that's an example of something you can do how about just to the, say this image is related to content. How about the meta tags, tags, and all these different stuff? Like, is it working now with Google or it's just like waste of time? I would not say it's a waste of time. Uh, Google looks for about 200 things or more they, they check for when they're looking and scanning. So I, I like to say every little bit help. Google does not put as much weight on meta tags and meta descriptions as they used to. But I would definitely recommend still doing that, um, not only because it helps, but also with certain things like open graph with Facebook and some other things. Certain social media platforms are looking for those uh, meta tags and meta descriptions to pull from when they're referencing a link to your site. So they're still relevant, I would say. So. Every little bit helps. I would definitely recommend still using meta tags, uh, meta descriptions. There's some platforms where you don't have to do that, but uh, for the most part, I know I still do that. It just doesn't carry as much weight as it used to because Google recognizes some people are trying to game the system, you know. But uh, I would still recommend doing that. So is that that like that's it for on-page SEO, or there are some more things to be done? Oh, there's a lot more you can do. Actually, uh, I had a somewhat of a little list I had. Uh, let me see if I can find that. I had a list of some things just because it's so much uh, with on-page optimization. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. I know one thing. This is more so on-page. Uh, many people try to get traffic, and traffic alone, you don't want just traffic. Because uh, anybody can get traffic. You want targeted traffic that is actually going to stay so when it comes to on-page SEO yes you want them to show up in the search engine and you want them to come but more than that after someone clicks in the search engine that is where the real importance begins because if they're clicking on a certain article yes you show up in the search engine yes you got them there make sure that content is highly targeted to your audience uh, and by that I mean if you're talking about a particular subject matter make sure you expand upon that that is quality content I always t tend to tell clients the more important thing is that you are serving good quality because if you're serving good quality you will naturally go up in search engines because people like your content and they'll come back so writing top quality is good and targeted content is uh, most definitely good and when I say targeted for example uh, let's say you have a blog post or something and you're going to try to reach your Facebook crowd uh, when someone comes from Facebook maybe they're seeing something slightly different than somebody who's coming from Google right so make sure your content is targeted because they'll feel man this was written just for me and I will come back again that's something easy you can do and that's your style of writing right so uh, that's another thing I tend to recommend as well. So how about PPC? Is it helping with the traffic of uh, of Google? Like Google will, if you are doing more PPC, means it will give you more credit or just like at the time of the PPC you're driving traffic, but Google will not give you points for that. So PPC, as you mentioned, uh, pay-per-click. Uh, I do feel that it does go into the marketing mix of building your brand and making your site more popular because let's say you have a website visitor that originally found you with a pay-per-click but then they see your good content and then they come back mm -hmm. right so now they're coming back now they've turned into an organic you know person you know organic visitor or they see your content pay-per-click and they like what you have so they tend to link to you now you just turn someone who was pay-per-click into organic in a sense so I feel pay-per-click is important uh, it's not everything right because you're paying for visitors but it is important to the marketing mix it does help with SEO if nothing else to help gain and establish links and build your brand so it does help how about off-page SEO off-page SEO uh, once again this is more so strategy of what I recommend people so it's more of a 
mentality of controlling the traffic you're getting off. So this is what I would say. Definitely use social media, whether that's Facebook, uh, whether it's Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, uh, LinkedIn, uh, whatever social platforms you can use. Uh, it's definitely good. I do have a warning. Uh, if you are going to use uh, those specific platforms, make sure you're active on them, right? Uh, make sure you're actively using them because if someone is on Twitter and you haven't said anything for six months, that doesn't look too good, you know? So whatever you social media platform you use, make sure you use it on an, you know, pretty frequently and you interact with people on it. Otherwise, it's really honestly making you look bad. So social media, uh, and I tend to tailor certain content to different crowds. So if I write a blog article, you know, for my site, NathanLote.com, uh, I may change it up somewhat for the Twitter audience, and I may change it up a little bit for the Facebook audience. Uh, sometimes I keep it the same, but once again, targeting your specific art audiences off of your website just to make sure that to pull them in they say I've had good engagement with them on this platform let me go to their site so social media is one big thing that I recommend using also serving up your content to make it easier for somebody to use later and what I mean by that is simply something like writing some of your blog articles or rewriting them around a central topic and offering it as a PDF download right so maybe not someone is going to be around uh, their cell phone or their you know computer but if I can have a PDF uh, printed download of whatever you're writing about or offering and it's nicely packaged and bundled together uh, that's something I can take with me share with other people but make sure if you do that of course you're referencing your website in that you know PDF offering that you're having so that uh, that's helps some of the to, for people I to say. come back you mean but no it will not gonna True. it's not gonna help in terms of SEO but it will help in terms of coming back uh, hopefully it will create organic uh, visitors with the time right so with with any blog post you provide um, like a download uh, mm -hmm. icon for the same blog post you do that with all your blog posts or, or you do it for specific materials specific material uh, surrounding a central topic specific material surrounding a central topic so and the good thing about a PDF is People tend to give more value to a PDF. I don't know what it is. Uh, I've seen some of the people that I've worked with and talked to online. They take the same blog post uh, packages as a PDF and now it's attributed more value. I'm not particularly sure why exactly because sometimes it's exactly the same, but people tend to give more value to a PDF. Also, if you have a PDF and you're hosting it somewhere online, uh, Google will index that, right? and somebody can reference it and that's still pointing back to your website as well if you have link active links in the PDF also um, I want to ask you like how about the keywords how to use what's the strategy to you to pick up the, the keywords if I am let's say now we have here uh, in my show we have different topics mm -hmm. most of them let's say about efficiency business but right most of them I mean most of the interviews are different if you compare them some of them about SEO some of them about web development some about uh, some of them about uh, health and fitness and different topics so basically we are targeting very broad uh, you know uh, market and and how can how, how we should use or pick the the right keywords is it like we target interviews for business people or how, how, what do you suggest when selecting keywords, uh, I think in the past I definitely tend to use uh, the keyword planner that went along with AdWords. Uh, but the biggest thing is discovering and finding out what are people searching for. And if you can find what people are searching for, whether you go to Google Trends or whether you're using the keyword planner for AdWords or you have an AdWords account and you can start to see certain quality scores for a certain or the price of certain terms. I tend to go with a strategy that starts with, okay, first, what are you trying to sell? Or first off, what is the audience you're trying to connect with? And then secondarily, it is, okay, the audience you're trying to connect with, where do they live? Where do they live online? Where do they meet online? Where do they talk online? Uh, one thing that I love to do is if I'm trying to develop a product or a certain blog post or an offering, going somewhere like Reddit, 
right going on reddit and asking a question and listening to people's answers or hey what is what is a what is the number one problem people are having in their businesses or what do you what is the number one problem you're having in your business and for free people are giving responses they're saying uh, i have a problem with you know uh, my return on investment i'm having a problem with some of my the financials going on here and getting their answers back using that to create content specifically surrounded about the areas they talked about right so instead of focusing on certain buzzwords i'm answering people's questions and making sure those answers contain what people are looking for uh, another strategy that has been around for some time is thinking long tail you know using long tail keywords and specifically what I mean is not just saying uh, mountain bike in Houston Texas but you know a certain specific brand behind a mountain bike and thinking ahead of what people may type you may not get as many visitors but the visitors you do get when you're using long tail strategy you'll get better quality of visitors. But if I if I if I chose let's say long tail key, uh, mm -hmm. key, keyword means that in every post I have to put this keyword long tail, or how it works like how how should I focus on these keywords? So if you choose a keyword, even if it is long tail, uh, make sure you're answering that specific question, or and also you're mentioning that in your blog post. Or your content or your page or you know your sales page one thing I would say is do not overdo it on the keyword uh, mention it a couple of times and make sure you know you're expanding upon the ideas surrounding those keywords because uh, if you're just randomly repeating the same keywords over and over uh, it can be detrimental as far as Google is looking at it so in other search engines as well but I would say include those keywords in your post and in your content but also make sure any terms that may relate to that those are also contained in there as well so mention it a couple times but have good content surrounding those as well but how about the competition like most of the people that maybe you find 10,000 websites doing the same thing that you are doing or, or having many of the keywords that you are using. Is that with posting more, posting more regularly, you will beat, the, beat them and you'll be more ranked on the top? Like how you will tackle that when, when you have, let's say, a website that competing with so many other websites in mm. the same area? What do you do for that? Correct. So if someone is just starting out or they're not as large, you, there is a lot to be learned from some of the giants on the internet and people in the you know top spots uh, one you know on the first page really there's a lot to be learned from them but the same strategies they're using may not specifically work for you um, so once again the thing that's gonna benefit people the most when trying to compete with those that are larger is serving more specific content the larger sites I, I also see they get somewhat lazy because they're trying to spread their net wide and get everyone and most mm -hmm. of the time when we're working with certain things on the internet you don't have to get everyone you just have to get the people that are going to be engaged to your content so when trying to compete against them I do observe their keywords I do look at okay let me see the keywords they're using let's just say uh, someone's trying to sell t-shirts online there's many t-shirt vendors online and as many large companies online so I do use them and observe them and say what are their keywords do they have the top search terms in their area so I do say to clients okay you should have these keywords because the larger competitors have them as well but I also use those keywords to see what they're not doing or what they're not taking advantage of and whatever they're not taking advantage of because certain companies and clients are smaller I say you need to beat them in that yes you may not be able to beat them as being the largest t-shirt retailer in the Americas but you can beat them as the best t-shirt retailer in your city so you might not be able to keep compete with them on a national even global scale but on a local scale you can beat them out and Google does have searches that are more tailored towards where you live right so so if i'm selling t-shirts in well. new york and uh, I'm, i decided to use best t-shirts in new york as a keyword 
shall I should use this keyword like a, or combination of three five words in every post or in every page on my website or how how should I use this keywords to be me to, to means that I'm using this key I selected I picked up this I picked this keywords and I'm using it as the major keyword to focus on. So I think a little bit of what you're referring to is you know the level of keyword density a site is going to have and uh, I know Google uses that to determine some relevance as well you could use it on every page uh, I tend to see people with what you just said best t-shirts in New York they tend to use that on certain taglines right so they would say uh, come to t-shirts R us best t-shirts in New York and if they use it as a tagline or at least in the general description of their website it shows up on every page so that's a smart way to do that or I've seen some people use that in the alt tag of their logo or something of that nature and then it shows up on every page again so that's another way you could use that and use that to your advantage uh, you could even break it down to the city level I when, when we're talking about larger versus smaller and local versus global uh, customer service tends to be a major thing that can beat out any of the big people any day because you're smaller yes you don't have any uh, resources that can compare to these large giants but uh, you can beat them in service every time so if you can get them to come to your page with the keyword uh, strategy that you mentioned you know mentioning certain terms on every page that's one way but also engaging with them and doing service is another way you're going to beat out you know the big boys all the time how long it takes to rank a new website on the first page of google uh depends on what it is uh depends on what it is and the reason i say that is because you know at least in my understanding Google is going to rank sites based upon their level of trust. So if there's a brand new website, it is going to say, okay, uh, one factor that it's going to use to determine the ranking is what other popular trusted websites are linking to this particular site. And if those other websites are trusted, then you'll get a bump up as being a trusted site because it's kind of, you know, word of mouth, these other recommended sites mentioned you so you may be of importance so it would vary uh, based upon who else is linking to you but also the content you're serving I know when I work with clients I tend to tell them uh, we can set up everything perfectly but is that that's just the beginning so you're not gonna see anything real until at least three weeks at least three weeks then you start to see certain results and trends after that I tend to tell people in a couple of months you'll start seeing if a certain strategy is working or not uh, and hopefully you have an ongoing strategy you're not just uploading something leaving it and hoping it's the best but if you can continually work on the popularity of your brand and putting the word out there that is only going to feed into how popular you will become in the future so no when I work with clients we set certain things up and we say we're going to continue the strategy but we're going to check back, you know, uh, at the end of the month or, you know, every six weeks just to make sure everything is going. Yes, there's certain things we check on a daily basis, but checking every day, you're not going to get the results you, you're you really looking for. Really, a monthly to uh, even two to three months, you can check in again to see if the strategy you're, you're using is working or not. What else to, to, to do off page, like in terms of link building? Is like people, if they are linking, let's say sharing your site on social media also works or only on their sites? And what else to do off page? One thing that I uh, love doing uh, is a little bit even of what you're doing now, uh, interviews or guest blogging. Some people say guest blogging is not as popular as it used to be. Uh, that's because it did grow so large. But guest blogging for someone else or some other avenue that already has an audience if you can write some type of content for them work with them uh, do some type of partnership if you can just present yourself to their audience and then at the end of it all have some type of reference back to your website uh, that is a great way to get people to your website we brought up PPC um, so any type of display ads would come into play as well there's some ad places like buy and sell ads that you can pay to send an email out to certain people's audiences already or you can pay to tweet about you know what's going on on your website as well but once again 
I have found if you use good quality content and reach out to people that are in that particular niche and let them be aware of it, if it's of great quality, they'll share it to their own audiences and their own communities on their own. And then there you go. They're coming back to your website as well. So those are some of the things that I recommend. How about tracking? Which tools you use to track the traffic and uh, what are the things that you look at in these uh, tools to, to measure the real traffic or real SEO progress of the site? Uh, quite a few tools. Uh, I have my favorite. I have my favorites. So, yeah, I'll just, I'll just go off of my favorites because I have many. I'll just use my favorites. But one thing that I would say is, of course, Google Analytics. I use that daily. And if you're not using Google Analytics, you should. Why not? It is a free offering. But more importantly, you need to know how to read it a certain way. But Google Analytics is one that I use. But what to uh, read in Google Analytics? In Google Analytics, I think mo most times Google Analytics is going to give you those base stats you're looking for. How many people are coming to my site? What are the pages that are most popular? You know, uh, where are people clicking? What is the visitor flow? Uh, how long are they staying on the website? Those are the base metrics of what you're looking at. Uh, a little more advanced techniques, you can look at the demographics. So Google will use uh, click data from AdWords and a few other avenues to estimate who is the type of person coming to your website. Uh, what is their age, right, based upon certain benchmarks. So, and that's another feature in Google Analytics. You can say, how is my site doing uh, when it is benchmarked uh, with the average of people in this industry. That's another thing you can look at in Google Analytics. Uh, but when I also mentioned you have to know how to look at it, uh, just knowing who's coming to your site is one thing. You need to use the information to make informed decisions on how to change and reform your website. If you have a nice looking website, and you've set up goals, meaning that you want the user to have a certain action on your website. And though you have nice content and though it looks pretty and it looks nice, if people are not doing the desired actions of what you would want, it's time to change up the website, right? So that's where certain tools like Visual Website Optimizer come into play. Uh, that is a tool that you can use to A-B test. And when I say A-B test, I mean you have a web page and then you have two different versions of the page. A certain level of people get served one page, the other people get, you know, page type B. And you can see what is the more popular one. And you can continually do that. So that's Google Analytics, Visual Website Optimizer. I like Raven Tools. Raven Tools is great because uh, you can connect so many things into Raven Tools, your social media, your Google Analytics, your AdWords. You can tie all those together and see are there any correlations with everything. Right, so Raven Tools is another great tool. Uh, Moz used to be called SEO Moz, but Moz is a, has some, a great tool. Uh, there's a tool called Screaming Frog. Have you heard of that before? No, no. Screaming but Fro for Moz, I'm um, interviewing the founder, and uh, I think oh, in okay. November. Yeah. Definitely. Well, <laughs> Moz has a great set of tools. Uh, Screaming Frog. Uh, they have a paid version and a freed version. You can use that to really see are there errors on your website and are you setting things up the right way. So Screaming Frog is a good tool. They're actually based out of the UK, I believe. So that's another great tool. Majestic SEO and probably uh, SEM Rush is another tool. Uh, I never used that in the past, but that's something I'm using more and more every day just because it gives you good inf information on your competitors. But now you use them all or like you use like also compete or you use them all when you when you take over a project of SEO or you just pick some? Depends on what it is. Uh, one of the first things I do is if, I, if I'm working with a client, I want to see where they're currently at. And based upon what they asked for, if it's, uh, hey, we need help on SEO or we need help with the redesign, I still use some of those tools. And the main tools that I use on a day-to-day -day that I always go to is going to be uh, something like Visual Website Optimizer because they have other tools like Optimizely. But Visual Website Optimizer, so you can A-B test. Google Analytics uh, because it's a great platform uh, and Google is always improving it and there's a lot you can pull from Google Analytics and another tool Raven tools uh, those are the things that I tend to use so much just because 
they have a wide offering of what they already have. They're established. And if you know how to connect all of them, uh, you can do many powerful things and make the websites better. Anything else you didn't mention in terms of increasing the traffic for a site that you would do, you can share with us? Anything else besides what I mentioned? Increasing traffic. I know not everybody has the budget, but a very wisely put together pay-per-click campaign can go a long way. And if you are utilizing that in the right way, you should gradually spend a certain amount and then if you're really paying attention to the ads you're using, the copy you're using, what is working and what is not, the quality score, meaning are the keywords you're, you're targeting, does your ad match those very well, the quality score that you have, you should continually refine that and get to a point to where you're spending less and getting the same if not more traffic. So maybe up front you're spending a certain amount, but as time goes by you should really start spending less and getting the same if not more traffic if you're really paying attention to it. I know not everybody has the budget for that, but uh, it's well worth looking into because there's just so many things you can do with that in conjunction with you know, organic as well. So if you have paid and organic, it's a powerful tool using those together. So how much it costs? Like, uh, do you recommend any any companies to work with um, uh, that they have a fixed or different plans on monthly basis? How much your company charge for that as well? Share with us some details, some numbers. So, correct, correct. <laughs> so, so now, pretty much it would depend upon the client and the industry and what they specifically want. Uh, most of the time, with what we're working with it is connected to some type of business goal. So for example, someone could say, hey, uh, we want to improve our website, we want to make more sales, then our company, you know, uh, in Focus Media, we need to tie that to some type of return on investment. So we tend to charge more now for the whole project and the time. So let's just say someone said, oh, we want to increase in lift of uh, 20%, right? So we would have to look at their sales, their yearly sales, if they have them available, and see what they're getting in a year. And based upon the work we'll do, it'll be anywhere between uh, 5,000, 10,000, or even more. It really just depends upon the lift they want to go for, and we tend to anchor that against what they're getting. Hey, if we can get you 10% uh, lift in your sales by converting your website, and your 10% equals, you know, <laughs> 300,000 more dollars, then, you know, you would have no problem, you know. That's beautiful. I like that. Correct. So do you, do you have some, Correct. some uh, let's say, plans that you charge per lead or per customer based on the agreement that you analyze a site and then you give a quote based on that? We tend not to say if you use us, you know, per, based on per lead, uh, you know, this is what it's going to be. We tend to have a flat price. This is the price uh, based upon everything that we've evaluated. And I will say, uh, you know, we're not just so hard, you know, cut and dry. If there's certain projects that maybe they don't have the specific budget, if we really like what they're doing, you know, we'll try to work with them. We may not be able to do everything, you know, under the sun for them, but we try to say, okay, at the very least, Here's a strategy of what we can do, but on your end, here's a plan, and if you follow that plan, you can be successful as well. So if we really like the project, we enjoy working with different people, different industries. We wouldn't mind trying to work something out also, but it really just depends on what it is. We do use, you know, per lead, um, you know, per sale when it comes to the proposal that, hey, we know that you get this much. We're pretty sure that if you improve your site, it will increase. But we tend not to use that as a marginal thing to determine our price. We tend to say this is the price. If you do, if you exceed it and do way better than expectations, great. Uh, keep the money, right? <laughs> you know, you, you've earned more. Uh, that's why we tend to go with a flat rate of this is what it is. And we know, you know, we'll get you some results. You mean flat you rate get... on monthly basis, right? Uh, correct. Or project so it, flat rate. It depends upon how long the uh, project is, right? So some of them, we just, we're just doing the work up front, and then we develop a strategy and give it to their team, and their team runs with the plan. Other times, it's, hey, we need you to put this in place. We don't have anybody in-house, so we will be coming back to you on a monthly basis 
So I know one project we worked on, we liked them particularly. It was a smaller business. Uh, I believe up front it started at about 5000 and then on an ongoing basis it was about 1500 But they also were given a plan of something that they can move forward with. We do like working with businesses and we do like recurring clients. But at the same time, we really work to empower uh, different businesses, and we've even trained certain people on what to do. So, and, and if so, if they have their own team doing certain stuff, you also guide those teams as well. Correct, correct. Okay. So we say this is what we have found it works. Uh, maybe you didn't have a time to develop a strategy. We've looked at everything. This strategy will work. Uh, you can take this plan and run with it. Uh, hopefully, you can take the reins and learn how to evaluate certain things. But even if not. Uh, no website is ever done, uh, is, is never complete, it's never the best, you're always working on it to improve it. So we may revisit them or they may give us a call uh, six months down the line, hey we're doing this strategy, uh, we want to continue to improve, you know, we're kind of stuck again and then we go, you know, we're already familiar with them, we hop right back in, reevaluate some things, tweak the strategy and move forward. So uh, those are some of the things that we do. You worked in many hosting. Uh, before the hosting, I want to ask you about the opt-in windows, uh, like when people call, use them to collect name and emails. Do you like them to be on the side, in the sidebars? Do you like them to pop up when some a visitor visit the website? Uh, do you like to, some people use it with uh, that you cannot skip them, you have to put the name and email. Uh, sure. Which one you prefer and think that uh, usually works with, with the traffic and, 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 uh, and to collect more emails and names and emails? Huh, I've seen each of those methods you mentioned be effective in different, different ways. I think from what I've seen, if you have a pop-up, people don't have a problem with that as long as it's not so much as an interruption to them. A lot of times, sometimes you go to a website, as you mentioned, I can't click on anything until I put in my email. That's a great way to get emails, but you will have those that crowd of people that will go to uh, 10minuteemail.com, create a fake email, put it in there, and move on, and then you'll have the crowd that will put in a fake email, right? So if that works for you, um, there is different results with that, but if you're offering a pop-up, you have to make sure you're communicating, joining the mailing list or giving my email or giving, you know, whatever piece of information I'm giving is really worth it. You're not just saying, hey, uh, welcome to my site. Thanks for your email. Learn more. You really have to develop something or a product alongside of it or something that's a freemium. That's what I tend to do. Hey, if you give me your email. I'll, I'll send, send you, you something. Con- yeah. I'll send you great content or you will get this book or you will get this video series like I have on my website or you will get you know, uh, something, a discount in the future. Really just something to make it worth their time. Uh, so pop-ups can be effective, but you have to pair that with something. Uh, using it on a sidebar is great, but if it's just on a sidebar alone, when someone scrolls down, it's gone and they're not thinking of it. So normally what I tend to do is, if I have an article surrounded by some relevant content, I want to place that particular you know, email opt-in on the bottom of the article, uh, even sometimes halfway through the article, and I'm tailoring that. I'm tailoring the question or I'm tailoring the header before someone opts in to what they're reading, right? So just to make sure it's relevant. I'm not only asking for your email, but if you're liking what you're reading, you can get more relevant content like this if you give me your email and also I recommend everybody have a newsletter page so have a newsletter page and describe the benefits of what someone is going to get if they were to join your newsletter so don't just say hey give me your email you know blog say welcome to my newsletter page you know these are some of the things that you will get and list out some bullet points for them these are some of the benefits that you will get when you give me your email. So when they give your email, they know they're going to benefit. They're not just going to have to guess whatever you're going to send out to them. And remind them, no spam. You're not going to sell their email, right? Because some people are just fearful of that. They have okay. enough coming in their inbox to, to, you know, to be cluttered. So they just don't want clutter. Okay, you, let's move to hosting. You, mo- you worked with okay. HostGator. You worked with the Bluehost, SEO hosting. 
what was your focus in these companies and which one you like the most and what is the best hosting that you recommend? Okay, well, I did, uh, people don't believe me when I say this, but I really did everything uh, for those companies. When I say everything, uh, I learned a top-down approach of pretty much the whole company. So I've done support, whether that has been uh, people emailing or whether it's been over the phone. Uh, people tend to say I was personable and they liked putting people in front of me because people like talking with me. But that helps you understand the common problems that everyone deals with and that can be used to make your hosting better, right? So I've done support. Um, I've also done quality assurance, making sure um, everyone that is working for the hosting company is delivering the best answers to the client base, you know, and uh, coaching them up on the best things of what to do, what to say, training them on, okay, you recommended this product, but really we had something way better over here, or, you know, if someone's trying to build a website, you don't have to walk them through building a website, why don't you recommend WordPress, uh, help them install it, and, you know, point them to a theme website that we discussed earlier. Certain trends like that, so I did quality assurance. I also even worked with retention, you know, keeping customers. Uh, hosting is a is an industry where people can jump to anybody whenever they feel like uh, based on the sale they're having or based upon if they're satisfied. So once again, if you solve people's problems, they will stay with you and they'll love you. Uh, whether it's solving a bill billing issue or whether it is really helping them accomplish their website goals. And I've also done some uh, server administration and even migrating. Earlier you mentioned is it you know, easy to transition uh, someone from one platform to another. I've done tons of that uh, with, you know, HostGator and uh, some of the others I've worked with. Uh, you mentioned all the companies. Who would I recommend or who would I say is best? Depends on what you're doing. Uh, I know SEO hosting was specific for the way they were set up is uh, you, they give you different C-class IPs so you can have different relevant content all hosted on the same server but you have them on different IP addresses giving you a bump in Google. Uh, that did work. Uh, that does work. But you know with uh, Penguin and some of the other chain, Panda, some of the other things that Google came out with, not as strong as it used to be but it still works and it's still relevant. Uh, who would I recommend? Uh, let's see. Some of the companies I worked with uh, they've changed somewhat, so I don't think they're as uh, dependable service-wise, at least from what I've observed. Uh, maybe I need to go back to doing QA with them, <laughs> but uh, some of the things I've seen service-wise out of them is not you know, as it used to be in the past. So one place I would recommend, or a couple I should say, is uh, Site5. I've seen Site5.com improve. Uh, throughout time and they're doing very well now site 5 is a great place to go to uh, flywheel is another great place uh, WP engine I love them I know many people that work with them I've worked with them in the past well, they're expensive uh, they are mm. uh, WP engine is expensive especially if you just have a WordPress but I will admit once again their service their services are out of this world if you need something so is it like hosting is about only the service in terms of speed let's say only speed all those big companies they have like big servers and they they they, they serve entertain so many clients and what makes this hosting faster than this hosting other than the service so, sometimes it may not be particularly faster because uh, we because we can sit down and do a speed test and you can see oh you're point three faster than this one well okay uh, but I know more things that you want to look for is uptime and dependability everyone is gonna promise 99 percent uptime but they're really not gonna have that um, you need to pay attention to server outages how and if they do have a server outage are they notifying you of that uh, that's important some people wouldn't mind a server outage but they want to know when is it going to happen no one wants to wake up in the morning go to their website and it doesn't work and they have no clue on why it doesn't work and all you're saying is uh, working on it you know people just want answers for what they're paying for what they've invested in so I have noticed certain companies that have said we're gonna focus on a particular niche 
and we're going to do this well, they're better prepared to deal with the problems. So if you're at a big box hosting company, you're hosting e-commerce, you're hosting WordPress, you're hosting, um, you maybe even be hosting some large news websites, you're hosting sports websites, you're hosting video websites, it's all over the place. So the different problems that arise are of a huge variety. And at least from what I've seen, not every person or every server administrator is going to be the best at dealing with that particular problem. But certain places, as I mentioned, like uh, WP Engine and a few others, and they say, we're going to work with WordPress. We know WordPress. So if you have a WordPress problem, ask about WordPress. We can answer it. And we also know certain things that trip up the server that WordPress does. So we know how to solve those problems because that's the area we have chosen. So I have noticed sites that said we're going to focus on a particular niche. They're more well prepared in dealing with certain problems. But I have to be honest, right now I'm using shared hosting. Uh, so I'm not on one of those niche websites. So I'm using shared hosting really because I know how it is on the front end and behind the scenes. So a lot of problems I have, I just fix on my own, you know. So, or I know who to contact. That, a lot of times, if I contact support on shared so hosting, so the name say, name of the service is shared hosting, or you're using shared hosting? No, on, no, no. Okay. Even right now, I'm with I'm under HostGator. Okay. Uh, I'm using HostGator, and the main reason I'm using HostGator is just because I know I worked with them in the past, and I know how everything works. So a lot of times, if I contact support, if I even have to. I'm telling them what to what check, do right? I say, hey, I've noticed this on a website. It's more than likely right here. So I'm saving them time because they say, okay, well, then they check their first and they're done. So, but not everybody can do that. Of course. So, so what is uh, the best hosting uh, suggestions for, let's say, small websites with not that much traffic and the best options, the best hostings for high traffic websites? Correct. So... I always recommend start where you are and then move along. So if you're just starting out or you're just launching a product or you have something new or you're just beginning a blog, whatever the reason may be, start small. So start with shared hosting. Shared hosting should be around $10 a month, not really higher unless you know they're offering you some type of premium support and a dedicated person to call, but really should be around uh, ten dollars that's you know American dollars so uh, what, what is shared hosting like shared hosting is they have what is shared hosting I tend to explain it in uh, living situations right so uh, <laughs> it, I, I, that's how I tend to explain it so if you're shared hosting you can think of it as you live in an apartment and you have roommates so because you have roommates everything costs less but at the same time, you're using the same thing. You're using the same resources. You're using the same electricity. You're using the same water. Uh, you may want to go to the bathroom, but someone's in the bathroom. I have rooms, so I have to wait. So, uh, so shared hosting is they normally purchase a server and they place many customers on that particular server and everyone is allotted a certain amount of space or a certain amount of resources and you have certain thresholds that you cannot pass as far as certain uh, whether it's disk space whether it's uh, resources or CPU requests and things of that nature a certain level of processes or you can only host a certain number of files they probably will limit you in some type of way but the good news about that is you can get your website online for not that expensive so it's a good it's a great place to start as you grow I tend to say you need to move towards a uh, VPS or some type of virtual private server what is what VPS? I mean VPS VPS is a virtual private server where they take a server and you can think of it they slice it in certain aspects so there's not gonna be as many people on your server so you have more resources to pull from front for your individual site and, and the whole using the whole housing example you have now moved out of that crowded roommate apartment and you are now in a condominium right? but it's so it's you, but it's the same it's also shared right it is also shared so what's you, the difference it's it just like they, they gave you more resources or maybe bigger space or true or fast, a bigger bandwidth, or these things. So it's the same thing, but they played with it, with it, and they called it VPS. Or it's really something different, comparing with the shared hosting. 
it's really something different it's more like you got a section of a dedicated server uh, it really depends on the architecture of how the host set it up but it's different um, they're not exactly the same most of the time you will have more control over uh, something like a VPS you'll be able to install certain things that's one thing that shared host limits you on they'll say you can't install that because it will ruin the shared environment but if you have a VPS most of the time similar to share hosting but you get the benefits of a dedicated server meaning more resources and I can install what I want and I can handle more traffic but if you continue to grow now, which is a good thing uh, one day you can maybe move to someone that's in your particular niche or a niche for the architecture you have like if there's certain hosts that specialize in Magento or that specialize in WordPress, WordPress. That talked about mm -hmm. so maybe you can move there or it's time to get a dedicated server but if you get a dedicated server many times people are paying for a managed one meaning that if there's a problem with it you can call and they'll work to fix the problem that you have uh, some people get dedicated servers if it's unmanaged a lot of times if you have a problem it's on you so you have uh, so, so the managed resources, just for the audience to understand and for me also to clarify that um, dedicated server is the same like VPS but it's only for you it's also managed by the hosting company but it's only dedicated for you for your company no it's not ne it's true. never shared with somebody else true true so the whole server is for you but then with that uh, sometimes different companies do different things but then you would have to remember you would have to do server maintenance so in, a lot of times the share hosting they're maintaining the environment for you but if you go with unmanaged which is normally cheaper than a managed dedicated server you have to keep up with uh, software updates you know different architecture updates uh, even sometimes security of your server you don't have someone constantly watching your server so there's different trade-offs but it will cost you point, more unless you are a big company and you have a big IT team working on it true true exactly exactly so at a certain point as you grow you do need to move up just so to make sure you can handle the traffic but if you do get a dedicated server make sure either you're aware of how to handle certain things or it's at least managed or you have a team with your business that is managing that particular server like we can throw out any of the larger companies uh, you know Google Twitter Facebook you know they all have different dedicated servers that they've chained together they have server farms so they move to a point to where they have many of their own servers but I remember when Facebook first started it was just on a couple of like one server and that was it but as it grew they expanded right so you would want to use the same mentality with your website and how much traffic you get so for WordPress, you prefer uh, WP Engine as the best in terms if you have huge traffic. One of the best. <laughs> They're one of the best, I would say. You know, uh, you know what I hate about these services is like they charge you based on the visitors, the number of visitors. They, it's not like you know how much True. you are charged per month. And this is what really I don't like. You no, know. I agree. I, I don't like that either because, you know, if you have a website and you're building traffic, it depends upon you know what's going on I have many associates I speak with online when they release a new product they have many visitors right but as time goes by you know they're working on a new product now so that same product doesn't have as many visitors and then they release something else and right it's a story of releases peaks and valleys so I don't like that either to be honest I don't like charging per visitor I like to know okay this is the flat fee this is the resources I get and if I need more then I will get more you know but uh, I, I tend to like that pricing architecture as well WP Engine is one of the best Media Temple is very good as well because they have certain solutions and many other companies like Rackspace have it as well Rackspace for, for WordPress you're talking? even for WordPress correct uh, they have good architectures because they will allot you more resources. They break it down like that. So I always tend to go with the host that, okay, I, I need to know how much resources, you know, my blog is taking up. If it's disk space, then I'll get more disk space, you know, or whatever it may be. If the visitors are causing more processes to pop up, then that's fine. I can pay for that. So I tend to like the companies that are offering resources based because you just buy what you need. And if it's a slow month, put me back down, right? 
and uh, let me move forward. But I tend to like that over visitor pricing, in my opinion. How much you charge uh, for consultation per hour? Consultation per hour, uh, it has ranged. Uh, just as I mentioned, try to work with different companies. It can go anywhere from 75 to 150, at least as of recent. Uh, what I tend to do with clients is we're going to go through a road, map, road mapping session or it's going to be what I call a discovery session where we're sitting down and we're really getting to the point of what are your business goals and what does success look like in your opinion because it can get too subjective if, if I'm working with a client and they just I want a pretty site I want a nice website that's too subjective what are your goals that you want to you want a nice site to do something right so normally when I meet that's an initial meeting we're gonna talk with one another and we're gonna map out the path of where to go so normally with that session uh, it can be Skype like we're doing or it can be over the phone or in person if they're you know somewhat close or I need to fly uh, it can be in person and we're meeting and, and Based upon if I'm flying out there, you know, over here talking or what have you, there's different pricing. But on average, that session is going to be somewhere around three to five hundred dollars, uh, especially if we're just talking like we are right now, because that's helping you plan a roadmap. If you end up moving with the company, you know, moving with my company, then the proposal has different pricing. But you can take that roadmap and use our company or go somewhere else if you want to. Uh, but that's just a small appetizer to get them acclimated to how we think so that, hey, this is the path we would take to reach your goals. And if you like that, then let's talk about different pricing from there. Who's your number one mentor? That is a tough question. Uh, <laughs> I think... That's a tough question. I've had seasons of people. Like when I was first learning everything, I would definitely say Jeffrey Way. Uh, Jeffrey Way, uh, he, he did a lot of those tutorials that were are on uh, Envato's website. Uh, he, I learned a lot from him, and he is a good teacher. He explains things in a very good, concise way that we understand. So at one point, I would say Jeffrey Way is it. Uh, at a different point, when I was pursuing the MBA studies, I would say uh, one of my professors named Steve Koch. Steve Koch worked for Sega. Uh, he also worked for Coca-Cola and uh, many other people, Pennzoil, that's Shell now. So uh, he's worked with many major companies and just the way he thinks is very practical and it seems like it cannot be that simple, but a lot of times he produces results so it is that simple. <laughs> So a lot of times in marketing, we think so abstractly, but sometimes the answer is right in front of you. So I would say he's, he's probably my number one, Steve Koch. But right now, I'm reading a book about uh, strategy and increasing your rates, and that's by Brendan Dunn. So it really depends upon what season I'm in. But if I had to choose, I probably would stay, say uh, Steve Koch if I had to choose. Top three apps that you, use, you are using on your smartphone? They're pretty simple. Uh, I love I love the mail application for uh, Gmail. I use that every day. Uh, if I'm on a desktop, I can type, but I get the same features in the mobile app, right? Uh, so if I need to talk back and forth with somebody, I use that uh, pretty frequently, and I like that. Uh, Google Analytics has an app, so sometimes if I'm out and about and I'm wondering about something and I don't have the ability to log in on a desktop and look, I can pull out my phone pull up Google Analytics, right, and I look, oh, this is how the website's doing, great, you know, and uh, I move on with that. Besides that, I have a task management app uh, with Teamwork, I don't know if you've heard of that, Teamwork PM, it's a project management software, you use the software on your desktop, and they have an app that goes along with that, and you can just keep track of, you know, certain tasks that you have to do throughout the yeah, day. Yeah, I use Asana. I love Asana. Mm. I love Asana. So teamwork, why use Teamwork? What's the difference? Because I, I'm a Samsung and Android person. Okay. And so I love Android. Uh, yes, there's benefits to using an iPhone, but I just like Android because I've made a couple apps for the Android really for certain clients. And it was to me, it was just easier. Uh, Apple tries to control everything, but that's good business. That's great business, though. So the Asana app a- for Android, I noticed some bugs with it that I didn't like. 
So I still use Asana to this day. Uh, I normally use it to map out all my tasks and assign it to certain people. So I love Asana, and plus, Asana's free. They have a good free offering as well. Uh, they have paid offerings, but their free offering is very good. But I just didn't like their mobile app. But I use Asana every day also. What are the habits that you're trying to develop to stay efficient? Uh, two main things. Two main things. Uh, those things are writing consistently. Uh, and How to do that? I, I have many friends that are encouraging me to do that. But in the past, I would work on projects and I would just finish them. So I'd finish the project and the only thing you're going to see maybe is a small case study or a summary. This is what I did for a client. But what people have been telling me is, hey, you've learned all these skills. Write more and teach others so that they can benefit. So in other words, I learned a lot from the online community and the internet, you know, the WordPress community e-commerce community seo community let me contribute back to that same community by writing articles on topics people want to learn about because there's somebody who was just like me you know five years ago six years ago trying to learn all these things and they didn't know so i need to write for them because there's always somebody who is just now starting to learn so that's one thing writing more consistently about certain topics even if they've already been discussed because because I have my own views, I have my own perspective, and you know, my own clients in which I learn things, so I need to write from my own perspective. And secondarily, another habit I'm trying to build also is capturing the creative process. Uh, I'm someone who likes to take on a project, and I only want people to see it when it's done, and it's finalized, and it's completed. I'm a little bit of a perfectionist, but I need to do more of saying, this is how it looked in the beginning. Here it is in this stage. Here it is in this stage. Here's the final product. So I need to map out more of the creative process. And that's, I've been doing more of that. But I need to also talk about that as well. Hey, I'm working on something. This is what it looks like. This is where we are. And I need to share that with the public as well so people can see kind of how I think and how I handle problems and how I solve those problems. Your top three favorite books. Once again, that's hard for me to answer. Uh, if I had to choose of all time, you know, that's hard to answer. I, there's many books. But there are three books that I've read recently that I absolutely love, and I've continually read them over. The first book is called Authority, and that is by Nathan Berry, Authority. And Authority is a book about writing a book. <laughs> So it's a book on if you want to quickly write a book about a particular subject and launch that book to your niche audience, it maps out what to do. Uh, Nathan Berry has some good success doing that. He launched a book a couple of times and then even a third time, and he was able to leave his job and just write books. So and, it's not get... only because his name is Nathan you like him. <laughs> true, true, true. Okay. So it's funny. Whenever we're uh, in an online community together, I'm like, hey, please say Nathan, which Nathan you're talking about. <laughs> But uh, no, but he had good success with that book. And now he's, you know, writing books and marketing full time. And he was a web designer, you know. So it shows the value of expressing your thoughts and teaching others. Because you never know what someone's going to learn from your experiences. So that's called Authority. Another book, uh, I, I love this book. It's called Double Your Freelance Rate. That is by Brennan Dunn. Uh, I mentioned it a little earlier, but... W Freelance Rate just talks about really you need to change the way you do things in your business to solve problems, not just be a commodity. So if you're a web designer, some people will come to you and say, I need a website. They don't really need a website. There's some end goal that they want, and that's what you need to get them to focus on, not the end. Otherwise, you become a commodity. Make me a graphic. Uh, make me a website. Uh, make me an e-commerce store. You don't want to be a commodity. You want to solve business problems because if you can anchor things in solving problems, you can use that to, you know, require more because you have more value. You're solving problems. You're not just putting making a graphic. You're making graphics that are going to entice people to click on something, right? Uh, so that's what that book talks about. It's very good. And very well put together. Third one. And, has, and the third one. Uh, Elements of User Onboarding. It is a very uh, relaxed, funny book. 
by Samuel Hewlett, The Elements of User Onboarding. Uh, me and Sam are pretty good associates. We talk all the time. And I like that book because he, he discusses you're writing a web page for a person and you're, you're trying to get the person to see that they will be better or their business can be better by using your product. Don't talk about the features, talk about the benefits. So a lot of times he talks about the onboarding process of getting a new you know, sign up to your email or a new participant or a new somebody to your new community for your membership site and he walks through the process of the good and bad of what you want to have when you're you know, signing somebody up for a new service. So those top, are the three books. Top three, uh, uh, like top three people that you are inspired by. Top three people. Um, okay, I would say there's uh, a guy. I don't know if you've heard of him. His name is Sean McKay. He is a letterer and a designer. So he tends to draw certain lettering and custom lettering and logos and brands. He has transformed himself into an entrepreneur and I listen to his podcast pretty frequently and I pretty much like everything I see from him because he's, he's like me. He likes working with high quality. So Sean McAfee, his website is SeanWest.com. So if anybody's looking at Sean West, W-E-S. So that's a good person. I say that inspires me to do better. I mentioned Brennan Dunn. Uh, Brendan Dunn inspires me to do better because he's at a point in his life where he's doing very well in consulting and he when every time I look at him it doesn't look like it's unobtainable so if you have business goals he's a good person to look at because he's not a rarity uh, you can learn from some of the things he's talking about and apply them and they work you know they actually work and um, the last person I would say inspires me is a friend I have and it's also a friend I have and I've consulted for his business and made his business better. Uh, his name is Obina Okongwu. Uh, that's the person that inspires me and the reason he inspires me is because I've seen him when he was, he does uh, videography and cinematography and things of that nature. So it can be a wedding or it can be a video for your business. I saw him when he first started when he was tinkering around with his Canon Rebel trying to learn it and to see the things he's doing now and it's been less it's been less than three years to see the things that he's doing now and now I'm even consulting with him on certain things he made a big jump and he made a large jump he was able to uh, leave his job and work full time and doing what he loves so that's another person that inspires me as well what are the things that makes you really happy really happy I really just enjoy making things better uh, that's one thing I I was trying to realize for a long time what what is it that I like to do I like making things better um, so for a website that's improving people's websites for my friends uh, that's talking to them listening to them hanging out uh, doing certain things so what makes me happy is just making things better and seeing the return on it so that's the thing I would say how people can contact you last question how can people contact me? Uh, you can go to my website. Uh, that is NathanAlote.com. That's N-A-T-H-A-N-A-L-L-O-T-E-Y. NathanAlote.com. That's actually, actually, yeah, that's my website right there. I forgot. We'll share it on, on the website. Correct. So, yeah, that's, that's my website. You can contact me there. I'm also on Twitter. Uh, if you would like Nathan Alote on Twitter, follow me there. I'm very responsive on Twitter, and I interact on that community. Uh, I'm also on Dribble, uh, and that's Dribble with three Bs. So any community I'm in, I'm uh, very active because, as I mentioned, I don't want to be a part of a social community and not engage because that only hurts your brand. So the Dribble is for uh, what the community? Oh, okay, Dribble is really for designers. Uh, different types of designers even if you're even if you do photography so they have a interesting community you join the platform you have a certain number of people you can draft so in a sense it's this self curation of people that are doing good work online so and you can uh, sell or people buy this work on on the community or just as a social media for for designers uh, it's social media, but there's different things you can do to say, hey, this is a product available, you can buy it. So some uh, people just say, hey, look at my work. 
Uh, also, you can find designers there. So you can find designers and developers there. Also, you can hire people uh, by searching through their index. So that's another way you can. You know, I, I've looked for people. And I've connected with them. And also, you can say, "Hey, I made this thing. It's a new service, and you can buy it." So you can also do that as well. Thank you so much for for this great interview, Nathan. It's the longest interview on Be Efficient TV so far ever. It's the oh, longest really? ever. Well, thank you. It's the longest ever because really I uh, like enjoyed the information and details and and thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. No, thank you. Uh, I do appreciate it, and also thank you for everybody that's on the Be Efficient TV community. Uh, I was honored and more than honored uh, to be I'm asked honored. to be interviewed. So uh, I do appreciate it. And whatever else you need or any advice or anything, just let me know. And uh, I'll, I'll keep an eye on Be Efficient because everything looks good from what I've seen. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Be efficient and stay efficient. And see you soon with another leading expert.